I prefer to call Thomas our agent of chaos. Agent of think? chaos, but he's going to agree with me. Maintain the three points of contact at all times, Thomas. That's my rule. It's way too real. Uh, speaking of falling out of your truck, you know, fall out of your truck. It's way too real to have that happen because I've had it happen to my drivers and they literally were, they call me and they're like, hey, I fell out of my truck. Yeah. Like, How'd you fall out of your truck? Do you not hold on to things? No, I was in a hurry and I slipped. I fell five feet. And then now you have a workman's comp and you can only afford the pop a bowl. That's what happens when you <laughs> fall out of your truck. That, you don't get the pizza, you get the pop a bowl. That's exactly right. Number one cause of injury to a driver is falling out of that truck. Hmm. You get a workman's comp claim and it's a pain in the neck. Yeah, you have it to is. Do all the paperwork and. You know, yeah, that's right. Man. And pain in the ankles, pain in the knees, probably a pain in the back, too. <laughs> that's my dad joke. It's of like the day. head, shoulders, knees, and toes, basically. It is. It is. It absolutely is. Hey, what's going on in Loaded and Rolling, my friend? Well, we have the newsletter, the new short and slim, slim down low carb one. Shout out to Kevin Hill because it turns out I use too many words, but. Uh, had a podcast recently talking about electric infrastructure. We brought back over uh, Rich Moore. He's a vice president fleet at ChargePoint. Had him over at a webinar. Super exciting stuff. And just talking to folks about like what it means. Everyone talks about the Nikola trucks. Everyone talks about the part of going. But there's a whole other game involved with actually making sure that it's able to be charged and that you can actually plug it in. Uh, to not only the grid, but wherever the heck you're driving to. So it was a fascinating conversation. One of the biggest points I thought was interesting was it's really great for short haul, 300 mile mileage band. But for the long haul truckers, uh, you know, it, it's still taking some time because when you're going to random places, you got to find a place you can charge and the infrastructure is just not really there yet. Absolutely. And that's kind of the million dollar question, right, is you have all of these companies planning for going electric, going electric, but they're failing to see the end point of, oh, God, I got to charge my truck when I get there. And a lot of that, too, you got to think about your driver, you know, if they're going on a long haul uh, they're, they're, they're going on a long haul route and you end up at a receiver who has no charging, then you're stuck. And then what happens? You got to jump out of your truck because you can't drive it anywhere. So that's kind of the point that I think a lot of folks are failing to look at, right? They're thinking about, okay, let's install chargers at truck stops and let's install chargers at our uh, hubs, but the receivers might be on that lacking end. Completely. And that's where uh, the charge point folks are coming in and talking about it just because that's kind of what they do. They deal with the act of charging things. And so for some of these places, you're literally going to have to talk to the utility provider, make sure they can provide you with the charger. Uh, let's say dig through a bunch of concrete, tear up your yard, install a bunch of wires if you have a 50 year old uh, warehouse, and then finally figure out when you get everything plugged in that you can plug in a truck, are you charging it during peak times? Because there's also the fact that instead of paying for miles per gallon, you're going to pay for a charge per kilowatt hour. So they've actually figured out it's super cool. Your fleet card can now pay for the electricity and the juice. And so there's this whole game about using AI to figure out when to juice the truck. Do you need it juiced now? Can you juice it later? Like the, the, the charging strategy is, uh, is extremely crazy. And so for a lot of these fleets who are just happy enough to keep the trucks rolling, it adds this dimension that not a lot of people are talking about. Yeah, but uh, when you start looking at this, two things. One, shipper of choice is going to involve number of charging stations and how quickly you can charge off those. That Write that down. That's obviously a a going to happen at some point in, in the future, right? But the rollout seems to be really, uh, we talk about short haul and mid haul, right? But it's that dedicated routes in those DC to DC. Like I see a target where they're running their, their own trucks are dedicated between their DCs and their stores charging on either end or just at their DCs. Huge play there, Walmart, other private fleets as well, right? Completely, and we're gonna see that kind of investment with private fleets because as we've seen with rates in the past two years, uh, you know, these companies are, are getting smarter. Dollar General investing heavily, Target investing heavily. You look at the earnings reports, that's the second topic we can talk about with trailer pools. Trailer pools ties straight into dedicated. Because mm -hmm. if you can have some kind of predictability and that flexibility, then that's going to set you up for success versus dealing with the spot market where it's either totally feast or famine. So, you know, the dedicated folks, the short haul, mid range, the tweener kind of thing, like when you're looking at these transfers, completely agree. Uh, that's kind of the next step. Random, semi-random, long haul, going a thousand miles, different places. Uh, we're at a two out of 10, but we're talking about transfers. Interest is like at about eight out of 10.
Yeah. So Thomas, that trailer pool idea is something that's really interesting, especially when you talk about fleet savings and kind of how things can operate if you're running that larger fleet and trying to cut those costs as a larger fleet. What do you think are some of those really key initiatives that they can use during trailer pools, or not even just with trailer pooling, but with other options to kind of share your assets that can help reduce costs? Well, it's all about the need for speed. Uh, customers right now with inventory levels do not like live load appointments. They got to find the product, the product's behind some product. Preloading your trailer gives the customer the ability to say, you know what, before I send you that tender that we talk about, uh, it may take an extra two or three days, but the carrier doesn't care because I have about 50 trailers and I'm going to I'm gonna pull these loads in as I need them and I'm going to unload them. So good for shippers, good for carriers because you, uh, you know, you're plugging in, you're, you're hooking up 45 minutes versus two plus hours. So there's a speed component. Large carries, when they're talking about earnings, Knight Smith's uh, CEO, David Jackson, on a Q1 earnings call talked about the huge demand for trailer pools because with ELDs, uh, they've gotten to a point where it gives them resilience. Cool factoid, 90% of the truckloads that uh, Knight Swift had said they moved involved a trailer pool and at least one side or both. When I say that, either preload drop and hook is both preload live or live load drop. You know, that's the way to get speed. But remember, it comes with a catch. We talk about the high inventory levels. I used to be a load planner. If you don't get the empty trailer, you're going to have a bad time. Then you spend time wasting driver's time on the back end looking for equipment. So it's a two-way street. I give you the trailers, unload them in a timely manner, and we have some sort of equilibrium. Yeah, that detention can uh, can uh, can creep up pretty quickly. It reduces cost. Does it help mitigate the reduction of contract rates in any way? It does in terms of it acts like a backstop. So you're going to see brokers who don't have trailer pulls, smaller carriers relying on live loads. Easy for a customer to say, you know what? I need you to go down 10%. You got gotcha. a carrier that has 2,000 pieces of trailers across your DCs. Maybe you're going to go down to 3% because two things you don't want to happen. One, you don't want to piss off the incumbent to move all that equipment out. And two, now you're going to have to deal with the, the uh, kind of problems involved with, let's say Schneider pulls 50 trailers out and then Werner US Express installs 50. It was really hard as a load planner to move trailers because I'm wasting driver's time with empty non-revenue generating moves. Mm -hmm. And so that where you can totally mess up a network, it gives you resiliency. So trucking CEOs like Schneider as well, they value the contract in the trailer pool because it's efficient and it's sticky. Just like how we see them with intermodal, he who controls the trailers or the containers really gets to set that tempo versus being on the back foot mm. when rates go down. It's kind of a stopgap. It's not going to save you. It's just going to hurt less. Got you. Makes sense. All right, Thomas, thank you for joining us this morning. I think that we'll have you in tomorrow as well to come in studio for maybe some carrier update help. We'll talk to you then. Right now, we're going to take one last break and then we'll be back to wrap up your show.